All right, thank you. I'd like to add my appreciation to uh, the organizers uh, for the special opportunity really to share with you some of these hot topics and ideas with you this evening. So every year the American Cancer Society uh, puts out their cancer facts and figures, and I just wanted to share with you what came out for 2012. And uh, it continues this trend, which is very encouraging, that the rates of cancer uh, incidents have, are falling for many, many cancers across uh, the spectrum. So this is very encouraging news. And in fact, um, there are some blogs and experts that are saying that over a million cancer deaths have been averted uh, just because of some of these trends. But uh, regardless of this optimism, there is still some, some work to do. Uh, if we look at overall rates of cancer, uh, invasive cancer, uh, men have a one in two chance of developing invasive cancer over their lifetime. Women have a one in three chance. And we all recognize the fact that early detection and monitoring is critical. If we just look for breast cancer, uh, we see that uh, the rates for detecting cancer uh, early, the five-year survival rate is quite high, 99% uh, uh, or so, and this falls dramatically for metastatic disease. So again, I think we all share this motivation that we're after detecting disease at the earliest stages when it's most amenable to cure. So much of the work that is done in coherence imaging of cancer uh, involves OCT, and we've been using OCT uh, to do interoperative uh, imaging in breast cancer surgery to detect tumor margins, to look for evidence of disease uh, prior to sending tissue to histopathology, and while interventions can still take place in the operating room. And just recently, we've been doing work uh, in imaging lymph nodes interoperatively, where we can then begin to stage cancer interoperatively as well. Also, this technology has been used for needle-guided biopsies. Now, a lot of the OCT imaging is done with uh, SLDs, broadband with sources, swept sources, and I really encourage people to attend the OCT sessions because there's been some remarkable advances in very high-speed uh, swept sources and, and various sources for OCT. Uh, if we look at nonlinear optics, uh, there has been source development there as well. And if we look at the scale of microscopic imaging, uh, this is work where we've used a dual spectrum laser source uh, that combines a tunable tie sapphire for a narrow band excitation of fluorophores, but also uh, broadening through a photonic crystal fiber. And this allows us to do in vivo human skin imaging to allow us to identify and segment out nuclei for tracking changes in cancer, and also to do this multimodal imaging with nonlinear optics. So combining the scattering from OCM uh, with the functional techniques of multimodal or multi-photon uh, imaging. And this is a, a nice example of looking at OCT phase variance imaging to look at capillary flow, as well as tracking bone marrow-derived uh, GFP cells from uh, following a bone marrow transplant in, in mice. Also, then we get the SHG signal for collagen. Uh, this work is being published um, this year uh, by Ben Graff uh, and others, and he's also giving a talk in the bio section coming up. Well, if we want to get to earlier changes, the molecular changes that take place in tissue, then we've seen some examples of molecular OCT. Adam Wax presented some nice work. Uh, we can go about this by designing OCT contrast agents, which are exogenous, do spectroscopic techniques, which kind of span this gap, or perhaps go after endogenous optical molecular imaging techniques. And one I'm going to talk about today is nonlinear interferometric vibrational imaging, or NIVI. Now, the motivation, of course, is shared by many of us here, that stained histopathology is the gold standard, uh, but this is largely structural, and it's largely subjective. And what we need are diagnostic assays and imaging techniques that can get at the true molecular changes that are occurring in tissue and do this at early stages. We also naturally have to ask, what is the appropriate optical sources that we need to develop to be able to translate this to the clinic? Well, NIVI, Nonlinear Interferometric Vibrational Imaging, or Interferometric CARS, was a technique we developed a few years ago that is based on the detection, the coherent reference signal uh, that is mixed with a CAR signal. With this, we can get both the amplitude and the phase of that signal. And in fact, the imaginary component of the nonlinear susceptibility is equivalent to the Raman spectra. Now, in contrast, the intensity-based cars, NIVI is actually, the signal in NIVI is linear in molecular concentration, and it's also free of the non-resonant background. With this, we get a spectrum, and we can decompose this to be able to get a, a better idea of subtle molecular changes that may be occurring uh, within the tissue. Now, this is a fast technique, so we can do imaging. And just recently, a lot of the work with stimulated Raman scattering shares many of these advantages. So this was some recent work that was published in Cancer Research. And what we're doing here is actually looking at two different types of markers, the ratio of, of collagens 
uh, to lipids, proteins to lipids, and using this as markers for evidence of cancer. This was done in a rat mammary tumor model, and we can color code uh, by doing some of the spectral deconvolution and identify areas that are clearly normal, areas of adipose tissue or normal stroma, and contrast that with uh, tumor tissue. We get very good separation and being able to use this method to be able to identify areas of tumor and normal tissue in this model. And in fact, uh, areas that fall close to this normal tumor boundary uh, are close not because they're ambiguous signals, but because those actually are sections that can contain a margin. And so much of our work now is looking at automated molecular tumor margin identification uh, as opposed to the structural tumor margins we saw in OCT. Okay, we can also do this in skin, and this is just an example of now that once we have this, this spectral uh, resolution, we can then decompose this into various molecular vibrational signatures and generate images uh, that are unlike CARS images, but actually based on these linear combinations of different vibrational states. And this is going to, we believe, be more diagnostic in terms of identifying abnormalities in tissues like skin uh, and the breast. Now, to get there, we also have to realize to translate these technologies, we've got to get away from the large lab-based lasers and uh, OPOs and uh, develop fiber-based sources that we can take into the clinic. And so much of the work in our last couple years have been looking at various sources. This is one source, a fiber-based source, that generates Cherenkov radiation. And with this, by pumping these photonic crystal fibers, we can get... Uh, very uh, tunable ranges of narrow spectrum light uh, at, with very short, ultra-fast pulse durations on the order of 100 femtoseconds or less. And so simply by choosing the appropriate fiber and pumping away from the zero dispersion wavelength, we are able then to, uh, to have this tunability. And this would be ideal for either nonlinear uh, optical imaging or two-photon excitation uh, or of CARS as well. Now, similarly, in addition to this Cherenkov radiation, we can also pump fibers to generate broad supercontinuum. And what's different about the work we've been pursuing is to make sure that that supercontinuum is truly coherent across the entire spectrum. And we need this for things such as cars and a lot of these pulse shaping techniques, which I'm going to share with you. So we've been pumping these, uh, and then also using MIPS and other techniques to compress the pulse, the shape, and uh, correct the phase across the spectrum. What we can do with this then is to add these types of pulse shaping to our microscopy setup and with amplitude shaping be able to filter out different channels, a green and a red channel, and then correct the phase over those windows to optimize uh, our, our compressed pulses. So we get very high intensities uh, for this, this type of nonlinear imaging. So with nonlinear imaging, either two-photon excitation or SHG or third harmonic, we get a, a, can selectively uh, excite uh, various fluorophores in these cells, either the green or this red channel, uh, we can see that we get much higher signal return and nonlinear um, processes from these compressed pulses, either in cells or this is in porcine skin. This is just really hot data, just acquired a couple days ago, where we're now applying these techniques to looking at normal and abnormal breast tissue from this rat mammary model. And again, we have the multimodal capabilities where we can combine the autofluorescence, the SHG, third harmonic, and start to see various mechanisms and modes of contrast. And we're starting to see very interesting features that pop out under different modalities and not on others, and how these can be combined in different ways to be able to, to truly have a multimodal approach for diagnostics. Now, we're not the only ones involved in this. I wanted to survey a couple other groups from around the world that are working in this, this push toward uh, clinical sources, uh, one of which is from the Zhu group at Cornell, developing fiber-delivered two-color picosecond sources, ideal for CARs, intensity-based imaging, where they combined the, the outputs of these two sources into a single fiber for delivery. And this is an example of CARs imaging of mouse skin uh, cells. Also at Cornell is the Weiss Group, and they've been looking at uh, doing, uh, developing a fiber-based source for cars that's based on four-wave mixing within these photonic crystal fibers. Uh, so generating the stokes and the pump beams to produce then the anti-stoke signal, and these are some examples of cars' images from various uh, cells and tissues. Our collaborators um, at DTU in Denmark and NKT Photonics uh, and us have been working on developing an all-fiber source, a monolithic source, to produce this Cherenkov radiation, as one example, um, and using a, a fiber-based uh, fiber laser to pump these fibers. Uh, I like the term... Um, of actually this is work toward a fishing line laser where the entire laser is, is essentially a single uh, fiber uh, made of various components like this. And that's work to come. 
Well, just recently, this work uh, was just published where uh, my group and our collaborators are looking at just the, the details of controlling uh, the uh, the polarization state in these supercontinuum fibers and being aware of the, f the influence that form by refringence may have on generating the supercontinuum. And all this effort is, is really to generate that ideal coherent uh, broadband source. Now finally, where we're headed with this, uh, large projects like this, especially translating them into clinics, it requires a large partnership of academic, industrial, and clinical uh, partners. And we're putting this together to, to essentially take our lab-based NIVI system into a clinical system uh, with a very robust fiber laser that's environmentally stable, combine it with handheld probes, and do this type of molecular imaging uh, indeed in the clinic. So just to summarize and predict cancer, uh, the impact we're having on cancer incidence uh, is evident. However, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of early detection and monitoring. OCT is going to continue to rise, I think, and expand in, in oncology. We'll see real-time uses of OCT for procedures and, and uh, various surgical operations. Uh, Label-free optical molecular imaging is going to develop for both in vitro and vivo applications. And these fiber-based uh, sources, these translatable sources, are going to emerge. With those, we'll follow new portable systems that can do nonlinear microscopy in the clinic uh, and be re relatively turnkey. And techniques like NIVI, SRS, CAR, and these other nonlinear techniques will really reach a diagnostic stage in clinical medicine. So I just wanted to, to say I'm a messenger here, and I want to acknowledge the, the many graduate students and postdocs and research scientists and collaborators involved in this interdisciplinary work, as well as just thank uh, the many funding agencies, particularly NIH and NSF, for sharing our vision and driving this forward. Thank you.